Go ahead and have a seat, and uh, if you've got a Bible with you or Bible app on your device, you can open to the book of Luke. You should be fairly uh, accustomed to doing that if you've been with us for a while. If you're watching in Parker today, we're grateful to have you here. You can grab one of the Bibles uh, that are at the table in the back of the room and join us there. We're grateful to have you as a part of our Calvary family. And, you know, we've been in the book of Luke for uh, 44 weeks this week. And for some of you, you're like, I know, I've been counting. When are we going to get to something different? And for some of you, you're like, can't we just hang out a little bit longer? I love just like slowing down and, and looking at the, the details and really diving in. And it seems like those are the only two camps that exist. Uh, and there's not much in the middle. And so if you're on the side of like, yes, I love this. Cool. We got a few more months. If you're on the side, you're like, what else is coming? We're, it's almost November, which is shocking on another topic, but uh, in December, we'll circle back to the beginning of the book, look at the story of Jesus' birth and what we can learn there, and then we'll be on to something new. And you're like, yes. Uh, but what's so interesting is that when you dive into to the, the books of the Bible, especially when you dive into the Gospels, you know, the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all cover essentially the same content, and that is Jesus and his life, his ministry, his teaching, what he did but they're all very unique in their own sense. And when you really dive in, you start to, to see some of those things. But what I also want us to, to make sure we don't do is we don't miss the forest for the trees. You know, we, you know we're, we're diving in today to just five verses and sometimes we're, we've even looked at less and I don't want us to miss some of the bigger themes that we see throughout the book. You know, if you sit down and were to read uh, Luke in, in one sitting, which is possible for those of you like, it took 44 weeks. It won't take you 44 weeks to read it in one sitting, I promise. But, but if you sit down, you were to see some of the themes that stand out. The, the theme of, of Luke wanting to be very convincing that Jesus is real, that Jesus is trustworthy, that the things that have been taught are, are worthy of listening to. In fact, it starts in uh, chapter one, verse four. He says, the purpose in writing, he says, is that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. He's like, I want you to have certainty that Jesus is real and this is who he is. But there's another theme that comes up as you read through the book of Luke, and that is a reversal of expectations. Jesus and the, the teachings that, that are in, especially the book of Luke, that Luke exclusively almost highlights, Jesus wants to reverse our expectation for how the world works, for how we expect things to happen, for what we would anticipate. Here's some, some examples. From the very beginning, we're told that the king of all kings, the God of the universe is coming to earth and he's being born in a palace? No, no in a manger, in a, a, a small town of Bethlehem. It's a reversal of what we would expect. From the earliest ministries, he goes and he teaches not to the royalties, to the dignitaries, to the, the elite. No, he teaches to the poor, the destitute, the forgotten. You, you see, there's not this, this welcoming from his, his home and his hometown, but in instead a, a denial, a reversal of what we would expect. Later, uh, as Jesus is doing his ministry in chapter seven, we see he is invited to a Pharisee's house, a religious leader's house for dinner. And the, the party's crashed by this, this woman of the town, this sinner. And there's a reversal of expectation because it says that the woman found grace and compassion and mercy from Jesus, but the religious leaders were condemned and criticized for their behavior that night. There's a reversal of expectations, even when Jesus, he's talking about what it means to follow him and give our life to, to devoting to him. He says this, um, at one point he says, forever who would save his life would lose it. Whoever who loses his life for my sake will save it. A reversal of what we would expect. Even when he tells parables, these kind of made up stories and made up situations with a point of, of making a purpose in his teaching, we see a reversal. You know, you see the, the parable of the prodigal son, the son that goes off and wastes his father's inheritance on sinful living and, and just goes out crazy. He returns home, and in the end of the parable, this younger son who sins greatly is welcomed and is inside in the party. But the, the older son, he's outside. He's representing the good moral Pharisee people. He's on the outside looking in. You, you get to chapter 16, a few weeks ago we saw there's, there's the rich man and Lazarus. Again, you, you, culturally we look at that, we go, well in the end, the, the rich man, he's done well, he's lived a good life, he's gonna be in heaven, but it's reversed. The rich man's in hell and, the, and Lazarus, this poor, sick, disabled person's in heaven. There's a reversal of, of expectations and Jesus is wanting us to see that how we see and view the world may not be the most accurate way to see and view it. 
And then we get to chapter 18, starting in verse 9. We're going to see that very same thing happen again. It says this, it says, He, that is Jesus, also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. He said, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast, saying, God, have merc- be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. The one who humbles himself will be exalted. So the reversal of expectations in nearly every way as we read this is as you look at at how we would normally uh, process this situation, this environment, these individuals, it's a reversal of expectations and it's done with a purpose. And so what I want to do today is, is look at this and go, what, what can we learn from this? What does this parable teach us about our life, about how we operate, about how we normally see the world and ourselves? And, and what's it have to do with following Jesus? And, and to do that, we have to understand these two individuals and how different they were and how they would be perceived in their time. And, and we see this, this religious leader, this Pharisee, this is the religious elite, the people who maybe that the crowd, the, the town, the people around him would look up to. Here's the example of how we're to live. They've got the squeaky clean lives, the good behavior. But he doesn't connect with God that day. And, and we're kind of given the answer of why. It's his pride and arrogance that keeps him from connecting with God because he's there just displaying, hey, God, look at all the things I've done. Look at how good I am. Look at what I have done. But the Pharisee, doesn't connect with God. He's there hoping that that's the case, and if if we're honest, that's why we're all here, right? We want to connect with our creator. We want to grow closer to him. We want to know who it is that that calls us to live for him. The tax collector, it's a different story. Here's the person that you might be like, well, why is that person even in church? What are they doing there? What's he doing in the temple? And he doesn't go saying, hey, look at how great I am. Look at all the things that I've done. Look at how wonderful. Instead, he says, God, be merciful on me, a sinner. He lives with humility. And he models humility both in his mindset and in his actions. And tonight as we look at this, that's going to be the theme of of what's it mean to live with humility. Because all throughout the Bible, as we're given instructions for what it means to live a life that's pleasing and honoring to God and growing closer to him, humility is the thing that is encouraged and modeled. But humility can be that, that difficult thing because it's, it's in some ways nebulous. And, and just the time we feel like we've got a hold of it, we go and make a statement like, man, I'm really humble. And then we blow it. We have to start all over at the beginning and go, well, apparently I don't know anything about any of this. But see, humility is both an internal and an external thing. It's internal with how we think about ourselves, And it doesn't mean that we just go from thinking that we're great to thinking that we're terrible. It's, it's bigger than just self-worth and, and being negative in that sense. But it's also more than just the external. See, there's a great quote that says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less or less often. And that's great for the, the external side of it, but I think it misses, where's our mindset? Where, where's the internal? If we go back to the start of this passage, I think it gives us some helpful information for how we are to process what humility is and where we need to start with this. And Luke says, he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. They, they trusted in themselves. That's a starting place for us. Do you trust in yourself? Are you trusting in yourself to solve the life's problems, to, to sustain yourself, or, or maybe even not that big? Are you in the place where you're like, I'm not gonna ask for help because I'm just gonna trust in my own abilities to do stuff. I'm not gonna admit fault or admit blame or admit weakness. If so, maybe you're trusting in yourself. And maybe you're like me and you need this sermon to go, what's it mean to not trust in myself? but instead to trust in the one who's greater than me. So four big ideas that I think Jesus gives us in this parable. And the first is that humility is the path to Jesus. 
It all starts here because if we want to understand Christianity and what it means to follow Jesus and be devoted for him, we have to understand that humility is the path to do that. Because at the very core of what our theology and doctrine is and what Jesus taught is the, the reality that we have to admit, I can't do this on my own. I need someone greater than myself. It's that act of humility saying we have to step into going, I, I can't trust in myself. I need to trust in someone greater. We have to admit that we're sinners in need of grace because we deserve judgment. And we have to go, I know that there was a savior who lived a perfect and sinless life. He died on the cross for me so that he could exchange his perfection for my imperfection. And that he rose from the grave three days later to show his power to change my life. That's where we have to start with understanding that. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you've done that at some point. You've gone, yeah, I, I need Jesus and his perfection in my life because I'm not able to, to trust in myself. And if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus and you're checking this out, we're glad that you're here. We love going, hey, this is what it, it means to, to follow him, but, but you have to understand that that's what it takes of submitting and saying, I can't trust in myself. I need to trust in one greater than I could ever be. And I start here because we have to understand that, he, that it's easy to view humility as just a skill to practice. It's like self-control or patience or forgiveness. We just kind of practice it here and there. And, and when we do that, what happens is it's really easy to take days off. It's really easy to go, oh, I'm just not gonna to worry about that today. And we start to drift into the place where this Pharisee was. We start to drift in the place of going, man, I'm, I'm pretty good. Look at my life. Look at what I've done. Look at what I'm avoiding. Look at the good things that I'm doing. We, we have to remember that humility isn't a skill to practice, but a mindset to embrace. Because when we see it as a skill to practice, it's really easy to just put it to the side and say, well, one day I'll work on that. And we drift over into the place of trusting in ourselves that we're good, that we're worthy, instead of trusting in Jesus, that he's the one who's worthy. And so what we need to hear in that as well is that our good deeds don't impress God. See, the Pharisee models that so well for us here. He models it of like, hey, look at all these good deeds that I've done and, and look at all this stuff. He compared his life to others and was like, hey, thank you that I'm not like them because look at all the, the stuff that I've avoided, but also look at all the good stuff that I'm doing. And he gives God his like tithing and fasting schedule as if God wasn't aware of what was already going on in his life. And he's like, hey, in case you missed the memo, here's what I'm doing for you. But, but the truth is that God isn't impressed by our good deeds, our religious actions. And it's super easy to read this, this passage, and, and I don't know if you're like me, but I read this, and, and my heart goes to, God, I, I thank you that I'm not like this Pharisee. I thank you that I'm not like him, comparing myself to others to feel better about myself. And then the irony kind of kicks in, and I go, oh, that's kind of an ugly place to be. But we go there so quickly. It's so easy to go to that place and, and to think, well, the things I've, I'm avoiding are what make God love me. We go, man, I, I'm, not, I'm not a murderer. I don't steal. I don't hurt people. I'm not sleeping around. I don't have those evil you know, political beliefs that this side over here does. I don't have these things. I'm not like those people. So God must be really happy with me. And we miss the truth of Scripture we find in Romans 3 that says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It doesn't say that the, the evil people, people that sleep around, the evil political people, those people fall short. It says, no, all have sinned. That's me, that's you, that's all of us. All of us are sinners in need of grace. So if for any moment we think, well, I can just go before God and say, look at the bad things that I've avoided that are kind of below my level of morality. I've avoided all those things, so God, I'm good enough. We have to be reminded that all of us have sinned and fallen short in our own ways. And we're all in need of the grace and mercy of Jesus to transform our life. But maybe we're at that place and we go, yeah, I get it. I, I get I'm in need of grace and so I, I, I submit to that. But now look at all the good things I'm doing. I go to church, I, I'm involved, I'm volunteering. I signed up for Main Street. I brought 65 bags of candy. I think I brought more candy than anyone else in all of the church. God must be really happy with me. And those things are great 
but they're not what get you forgiveness. And the moment we start to think that our good deeds, our religious actions are what make God forgive and love us, we need to remember Isaiah 64, 6. In the NIV, it's translated, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. The ESV translate it as this. It says, all of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. If you're like, what, what's it talking about there? The background that they're trying to dance around is, they're saying all of our religious and righteous actions are the equivalent of a used menstrual cloth before God. And if we say, look at all the good stuff I've done, look at my church attendance record, my life, God, I'm leading a life group, I'm involved here, look at, look at my tithing record, God. And we think that's what makes God happy with us. It's going before the creator of the universe and going, here's my good deeds, but it's the equivalent of that polluted garment. See, it's not our good deeds that, that get us favor before God, it's the goodness of Jesus. And it's us saying, I can only trust in the righteousness of Jesus in the exchange that happens on the cross, not my own actions. So today, I don't know where you're at with this. I don't know if you are thinking that avoiding the bad things in life are earning you favor. If you've been around church for a while and you're like, well, look at all the good stuff that I'm doing. But I want us to remember that the way to, to find what we're looking for in life is by trusting in the goodness of Jesus. That it doesn't mean that, that living moral lives or, or volunteering in the church and getting involved is a bad thing. But we have to ask, what is our motivation there? If we're doing those things to earn God's favor, to get forgiveness, to, to hopefully one day find our way into heaven, but it's all done without Jesus, we're gonna be sorely disappointed. But if we're saying, God, you have changed my life, you have forgiven me, and now I want every aspect of my life to reflect that, so my giving, my time, my involvement, my way of serving, my way of living, the way I, I do relationships, the way I do sexuality, the way I do everything, I'm giving it all to you, then that's, that's a, a beautiful act of worship before our God. So I guess the question we need to ask is, are we doing things to get God's love, or are we doing things because we've gotten God's love in our life? Because there, our good deeds don't impress God and the reason for that is because God cares about the internal more than the external. And that's really what this parable highlights is he's comparing these two things. The external differences between these two individuals couldn't be more different. I said a couple weeks ago when I referenced this parable in a sermon, I said that our, our modern day equivalent would be like a, a pastor and a politician. You know, we could say, hey, a, a pastor and a politician walk into a church to pray. It sounds like the beginning of a bad joke, right? But, but as we interpret those roles and responsibilities, it's similar to how they were. You know, generally we think, yeah, a pastor is generally a good person and, and lives like the way that we'd kind of hope to be. They're kind of that example and model for us in the same way politicians, we generally dislike them as a category because of corruption and, and, and bad ethics. And that's exactly the case here. The Pharisees were the pastor of that day, the religious leaders, the people who said, hey, I'm committed to good moral living and, and setting a standard for you. And the tax collectors were generally hated because they were corrupt, because often they would steal from their own citizens and, and, and double-cross people. The external differences are so stark between these two people. And that's exactly why Jesus told the story this way. Because... He wants us to see that God cares about our heart and sees where our heart's at. See, the external is, is so complicated, but God sees through all of that and sees where our heart is at. And this is so important and, and maybe even challenging for us because we live in a world and society that's so good at crafting the external. We use the internet and social media to craft a, a perfect highlight reel of our life that's curated and, and glamorous and pretty for the outside world. We, with our relationships with coworkers and friends, we, we craft what we tell them and what we don't so that we just give them the good stuff. You know, just, just good enough to make them jealous and be like, oh, I wish I was on that vacation or doing that, but we skip the stuff where we had an argument with our spouse, where we got really irritated, where our life is challenging and difficult. With our finances, we buy stuff that we really shouldn't and we can't afford just so we can have a certain appearance and impress the people who really don't care about it anyways. And when people ask, how are we doing? 
We say we're good, we're great, things are going good, even if we're miserable and struggling on the inside. We're so good at crafting this perfect essence on the outside that maybe we even get to the place that we think that we're the only ones who know the real us. But listen to what scripture says. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, it says, for the Lord sees not as the man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Psalm 139, 1 and 2 says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. See, the, the glorious and maybe terrifying truth is that God knows everything about our life. He knows our thoughts. He knows our actions. He knows our, our words. He knows everything, even in those secret places. So the terrifying thing is that God knows the lie you've been repeating for years, the sin that you've been hiding, the, the ways that you're faking it in life. He knows and sees all of that. But the, the glorious truth is that he sees the other side of it too. He sees our heart when we say, God, I want to follow you and serve you. He sees our heart when we go, man, I wanna be more obedient to you, but my, my actions are kinda lagging behind a bit and there's a gap here that we usually call hypocrisy. He sees where our heart's at there. He, he loves and welcomes us when people label us and judge us for our past. And we see this glorious truth taught through the, the storyline of scripture that, that God's not waiting for us to reach some level of perfection, but he loves us where we're at because he sees our heart. So today, where is your heart at? Are you trying to put on a show and, and put on a, a perfect curated image of what your life is like for everyone around you? Are you trying to, to, to impress people, even impress God and say, hey God, look at, look at what I'm able to do for you? Or are you like the tax collector who says, hey God, I'm a sinner. Be merciful on me because I want to follow you. Because what we see here as we wrap up is that humility offers us the great reversal. The great reversal that takes place, if you catch how Jesus ended this parable, he says this in verse, uh, verse 14, he says, um, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. I remember reading that for the first time many years ago, going, what? What do you mean if I exalt myself will be humbled, but if I humble myself will be exalted? That doesn't make any sense. But Jesus offers us the great reversal here. And he, and he shows us here that, that when we think we need to put on this great image and, and curate everything and self-promote ourselves and, 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 and live with this like perfect shell of a life, we're actually gonna be pretty disappointed. Because here's what's happening. As we're saying, God, hey, look at, look at how great I am. Look at all the good stuff in my life. As we're curating this image and facade for the world around us, people see that. People see through it, especially the people close to us see through it and know that it's a lie. And even if they don't, there's that tinge of, man, I don't know about that person. I just don't know if I can trust them. And especially for the people close to us, as we pretend and, and put on a show we're basically creating this character of who we are and asking them to love and care about someone who doesn't exist. I heard it explained that way a, a couple weeks ago and it ch completely changed the way I viewed this, that, that even when, and well-intentioned, when we go, oh, I'm just not gonna share that with them because it's really heavy and I don't wanna weigh them down, so I'm just gonna go, yeah, I'm good. Work was great today, I'm doing great. We create distance in our marriages and our friendships and our family because we create this facade of this person who doesn't exist, this person who doesn't have issues, who, who isn't hurting and struggling in certain ways. And on the backside, we wonder why we don't feel the closeness that we're looking for, the, the fulfillment and relationships that we're longing. And then remember the words of Jesus, that when we humble ourselves, we'll be exalted. When we humble ourselves, we find what we're looking for. See, today as we look at this passage, I know that, that we get the option of reversal here. That when we surrender our life to Jesus and his plan, we find what we're looking for. When we surrender to this path of, of, of humility and transparency, we find the life that God's created for us. 
And this is a big one for us here at Calvary. It's why one of our values is transparent living. Because we do believe that God's designed and desires for us to be real and open and honest about who we are and to invite other people to do the same thing. And see, normally we look at the idea of surrender as a bad thing, of, of losing freedom, of losing possibilities, of, of being defeated. But in Christ, surrender brings freedom. Surrender brings joy and purpose and fulfillment. So today, as we kind of step back from this passage and, and think about the ways that, that Jesus reverses our expectations for life, my question is, will you step into a place of surrender? Will you surrender your uh, idea of, of a perfect life? Will you surrender the, the hope of trusting in your accomplishments or your morality? Will you surrender the, the perfect image that you want everyone to see? Will you surrender trusting in yourself and trust in Jesus instead? Because when you step into the place of humility and transparency, we're gonna find the fulfillment and connection to God. We're gonna find the connection to, our, to people and we're gonna be released from the burden of thinking we have to try harder and do more and be better. So today, will you surrender and find freedom in Christ? Let's pray. God, we thank you for the glorious truth that you love us even in the mess that we're in. I thank you for the truth we find in Romans that says even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Because it's so easy to think that we have to clean up our life to come before you, that we have to, to, to be perfect enough to be loved by you, that there's some transaction, that, that our goodness is what gets love from you. But God, thank you for the truth that we can see all throughout scripture, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That, that we are loved by you because of where our heart is and devotion and trust to you, not where our actions are in a transactional exchange. So God, help us to step out of the place of trying to impress you or impress others. Help us to, to step out of the place of thinking we need to, to pretend and trust in ourself and help us to trust in you. Because we've seen it in our life when we trust in ourself, we're gonna be disappointed and let down. We're going to be humbled. But God, we want to humble ourselves before you and pray like the tax collector. God, have mercy on us as sinners so that we can be exalted in your kingdom one day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.